decisions. It's our, the Bible is the go-to in our society when these issues come up all the time. What does God have to say about it? Same-sex marriage. Our first response shouldn't be, what does the government have to say about same-sex marriage? But first, what does God say? More recently, I mean, that's come and gone, but it's still an issue. But more recently, the euthanasia has been up again. Euthanasia. Now, I'm not sure, uh, you know, where everybody here might stand, but our first go-to should be, you know, the Word of God itself. What does God have to say on it? Marriage. What does God say about marriage? What is marriage? The home, parents, raising children. And the list goes on and on. So when it comes to these issues, we see that the Word of God, there, there are three areas that we find ourselves in the Word of God. One is when God's Word is clear. It's clear. You don't have to spend a lot of time praying about this when God's Word is clear about things. God's view of sex. He has much to say on this. On marriage, on divorce, and yes, homosexuality. So there's lots in God's word. And so, you know, when it comes to where are we going to stand with this ethically, then the first go-to is what does God's word say? And it's not silent on these kind of matters. The second thing that we might find in the word is when God's word has uh, principles. Principles. It may not be exactly clear. For example, you're not going to open your Bible to the concordance and look for euthanasia and find verses on euthanasia. When I say euthanasia, I'm not talking about young people in China. <laughs> Just make that clear. <laughs> So God's Word doesn't specifically mention that. But we do find many passages and many principles on who is the giver of life and the sanctity of that life. And so we draw our conclusions from the principles of God's Word. Then there are times when God's word is silent or quiet on a particular subject that we're looking at. We may not be able to find a clear yes or no, or even we're half struggling to find principles on a particular topic. And there are some of these, and that's addressed in the likes of uh, Ro Ro Romans, sorry, Romans 14, when there's brothers and they have some d differences in opinions about some things. Or what do we do when God's word is silent on a particular subject? If we live by the mantra, if God's word doesn't say not to do something, then I'm doing it, that could also lead us to trouble. Yes. We must be careful with that. And this is where Christian maturity is important. One who has attuned themselves to the meat of the word and their senses are trained to be able to know good and evil. And in these times when you might struggle to find a clear word or a principle, um, that's when we have brothers and sisters and pastors and teachers to also help us with these matters too. And listen to their wisdom and walking with the Lord as well. We need that. We need that at times. But those who are full age, mature, rightly dividing the word of truth and discovering personal convictions. This is important. Why don't we just give you a list of the things that, of convictions that the church says, this is what we say is what you should and shouldn't do in all areas of your life. Let me give you two things to avoid when we're talking about uh, developing Christian ethics when we're talking about um, 
these convictions. Let me give you two things to be careful of. The first one is called legalism. You've heard the term legalism, yeah? Okay, in the very strict sense, legalism is adding of works to secure salvation. Okay, so sometimes in the scriptures you might see, you know, the struggle that they had in the early church where people were coming in and saying, ah, okay, well, Christ is great, and that's good, you need to trust Christ, but you also need to be circumcised and follow the law and do these other things. And we take a look at that and say, no, and rightfully so. That's what Paul told us to say. These were adding to the gospel, and that is no gospel at all. Okay? And so that's, in a very strict sense, legalism. But we also see another kind of legalism. That is this. Paul talked in Galatians chapter 3, verse 3, to the church at Galatia. He says, are you so foolish? Having begun in the spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? This is another legalism. We see he was urging his brothers in Galatia not to return to the law. He wasn't talking about for salvation here because he says they already begun in the spirit. Paul acknowledged them as brothers in the Lord and they had already begun their Christian walk. They were saved. They began in the spirit. But what he was talking about was being made perfect or mature, um, um, being complete in Christ, growing in Christ, or growing in the flesh, in the law. Let me show you a picture. This is me and my lovely wife, Jim. Oh. My very happy day. <laughs> oh. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, this uh, was in, we got married in December of 1990. So that makes us 27 years of marriage. Okay, stop that now. <laughs> I married my best friend. And so when her birthday comes up, do I have to say, oh man, great, now I have to buy her another present? <laughs> oh, every year the same thing. Is that my attitude? Should it be my attitude? Oh, it shouldn't. Okay, I'm not a perfect husband. That should be my attitude. My desire should be, I'm going to get her something. Uh, and it's with anticipation and it's with excitement. Because this is Jim. This is somebody I care about. I love her. That's the way it should be with a husband and wife. Do I get really discouraged because, man, another Friday night's come and... I'm married to Jen, so I can't go out on dates with other ladies. Do I get discouraged about that? Again. No. I shouldn't get discouraged about that. Shouldn't. I don't. Because I love my wife. I love her. My desire is towards her. Our marriage is based on a relationship together and not the legality of it. It's the same with God. Be careful of legalism. Don't get into that trap. Yes, immerse yourself in the Word of God. Ground your philosophy in the Word. Your ethics come from that. And decisions that are made need to be made on the basis of the Word of God. But be careful not to fall into legalism and thinking that your performance and your making the right decisions and choices constantly is make you know you're you're getting pretty puffed up and more spiritual than everybody else and everybody else needs to follow exactly everything that you're doing be careful of legalism the other thing to be careful of is this word called license license i'm not talking about driver's licenses get the driver's license okay if you don't have a driver's license how should we define license? Back to my illustration of our marriage. Now that Jen and I have been married, I have a piece of paper that can legally prove it to everybody. <laughs> okay, we're past that one. I got a piece of paper that can prove it to everybody. Therefore, since I'm married, I can now go out with all the girls I want to now because she's already married to me. 
Does that make any sense? You're scratching your head with that one. Of course that doesn't make sense. But Jesus Christ saved you. He forgave you all your sins. He washed them away. He's removed them far from you. As far as the east is from the west, he no longer will hold them against you ever again. There is no condemnation of those in Christ, ever. You are eternally saved. What is your proper response to such news? Awesome, so I can now sin all I want. Right? Now some people get this funny idea that I'm saved. It doesn't really matter now how I live. I'm forgiven. Christ forgives me all my sins. It's okay. And that really makes no sense either, does it? And Paul answers this question in Romans 6, verse 1. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How can we who died to sin live any longer in it? You died to it. If you're in Christ, you died. When did you die? You died with him on the cross. I wasn't there. Well, you weren't there when Adam sinned either, but you sinned in Adam, didn't you? You sinned in Adam. And you fell because your great, 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 so on, grandfather Adam sinned in the garden. And so you also have sinned. But the Bible talks about this spiritual fact that we died with Christ. And we were also resurrected in Christ and raised to a new life. And that's what the picture of baptism is all about. It's not just a picture of Jesus dying and being buried and raising again on Easter. But it's also our death with him and our burial and our resurrection to a new life in him. You have a new life. And so Paul is saying, how can you continue to live in sin? You died to it. It doesn't make sense. It's like me saying, I got a marriage license. I can go do whatever I want with any other girl I want to. It just doesn't make sense. How can I do that when I am married to Jen and I've given her all my love and she's given me her love? How can I do that to God when he has washed away all my sins and I jump right back into it? That doesn't make sense. And that sounds like the thinking of a professor of faith, not a truly born-again believer. That's right. The true Christian has a different desire. And our desire becomes more and more about pleasing our Lord. Amen. We have seen our primary goal. Our goal is to live a life pleasing to the Lord, to be fruitful, to grow in the knowledge of Him. We've seen our primary tool, and that is the Word of God itself. We need the tool. Not about legalism, not about license, but a growing relationship with Christ. Now let's take a look at our primary motive. 1 Corinthians 6.12 Paul writes, All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought into the power of any. Paul's talking about times when he's faced with some choices. And there's these dilemmas that come up. The semantical issues that come up. And so he writes, I'm in Christ, all things are lawful. I'm not under the law, but all things are not helpful. And I don't want to be brought under the power of any. In chapter 10, verse 23, he says, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. Sounds a lot the same, doesn't it? But then he adds, all things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. So here Paul is reinforcing, he is free from the demands of the law. Christ has fulfilled the law and set him free. And you are freed from the law, but you are now married to another. You are free from the old law that condemned you. Because it was unforgiving and it didn't make any exceptions and it didn't give you the power to be able to keep it. But Christ fulfilled the law and he died in your place. 
And he's set you free from it. And uh, I don't want to talk about that right now. But here we see two qualifiers of the ethical dilemmas that he might face. The first one is this. Does it bring me under its power? Does it bring me under its power? Now there are things that take our affections and our attentions and that can control us and become powerful in our lives and take our focus and attention away from Christ. Paul says, I don't want to be brought under any of that. Now right away you can think of some things in your life that maybe fall into this category. Alcohol is a real potential danger, isn't it? I don't want to be brought under the power of anything. Drugs, we know that. I don't want to, you know, it's hard to be a drug addict and fully committed to the Lord. That's hard. Uh, smoking, these things are hard. They're, 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 they're traps, and they can bring people under their power and control them. And, and we understand that. But there are other things that maybe aren't so easy. It may not be necessarily the same for everybody. But things that maybe can gather and control and take your attention and consume you too much. That takes your mind away from the Lord. It may not even be a sin in and of itself. But it just might be something that is bringing you under its power. And there's lots of things in life like this. And we need to be careful of this. Nothing should take the role of Jesus Christ in our life. Is eating sin? Is eating food sin? And no, I hope not. We've enjoyed some food, even here at this camp on Christian ethics. <laughs> so we hope that we're not blowing it even as we're at camp. Can it become sin? Yes. For sure. It can have such a hold on a person. It can bring somebody under its power so much to the point that it can consume them, kill them. Yeah. We need to be careful and not be brought under the power of anything. Is sex a sin? No, of course not. Can it become sin? Of course it can. It can be very destructive. The Bible has so much to say about sex. In the New Testament, lots of warnings to the church on, on um, sexual relationships and how we are to conduct ourselves. And God is the designer of sex. And when used in His way and according to His instructions, it's a helpful thing that can build relationships and strengthen families and and bind them together. But we see so often, like a small fire, it can just be consuming and get out of hand and destroy instead of help. And more often than not, in our culture, we see it destroy and hurt. It's painful. People give themselves away. It's, yeah. You go up to an average young adult in Auckland and you mentioned to them, you know, me and my wife didn't uh, live together. We didn't even have sex together until after we got married. And they'll look at you. What? You didn't live together? Are you crazy? And they'll just look at you like you're from another planet. Because nobody does that. It's the truth, isn't it? You know what it is. It's norm. I don't mean norm. It's normal. <laughs> Sorry, I just thought about it. He gave me the look. <laughs> um, it's normal. And the thought of, you know, this way, that just is archaic and backwards. And how can you, how, you know, know if you're compatible? How can you have a relationship that way? Well, the way the world isn't working, is it? Are drugs a sin? 
Same thing. They can be helpful, can't they? Uh, drugs are a wonderful thing. We need drugs. Drugs save people's lives. Some powerful drugs also help people in big crises. I've seen people with some horrible accidents and without some powerful drug, they just be screaming in agony. And so we're thankful for drugs. Can they be a sin? <laughs> we don't have to think hard about that. Of course they can be. We gotta be careful. We're not brought into the power of any. Young man in our church uh, had appendix burst and um, he got infection and he was in the hospital for a long time and he was on a high dose of the morphine while in the hospital because of the pain. He needed it. Trouble is, he was so long getting over that infection that uh, it caused him some difficulties. And he got out and he found he was having major withdrawals from not having the high doses of morphine anymore. <sighs> And he got over it, praise the Lord. Got out from under its power. So yes, it's helpful, but yes, we see so often the danger of drugs. Another young man in our church got hooked on this, what is it called, P? Methamphetamine? Uh, P is a dangerous, nasty thing. I don't know if there's any redeeming qualities in P for medical use. It's a dangerous thing, but people do it anyway. I don't understand that. Just to see what it will do, to see if it will affect them in a bad way. But he got hooked on it. He came to know Christ, but my friends, and I, I really do sincerely believe he, he came to know Christ. But oh, he's had so much struggles in overcoming this. Paul says, where does it bring me under its power? There are many things that we could answer this in our lives. Does it bring me under its power? Like I said, not all things are just sin. Some things are just neutral. You know, some things God made. But they can become sin if we allow them to bring us under their power. The second thing, the second uh, qualifier Paul brings up is this one, does it edify? That we saw that in the second passage that we looked at in uh, 1 Corinthians 10. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. This means, does it build up others around me? It's not just about you. Your life is not just about you and what's good for you, what you feel best with, what you're the most comfortable with what you like to do the most. You have to think about brothers and sisters in the Lord. You're a part of their lives. Everybody should be a part of discipling others. Discipleship isn't just a class. It's not just a class that pastor is to teach. You're discipling others in your walk, in your example, in your words, in your speech, and in your actions. You're to be a disciple. You who have been Christians for some time, you need to be looking around at younger believers. Kind of take them under your wing a little bit more. Yeah. And disciple them. It doesn't mean, like I said, I'm not just, I'm not talking about a class. It might be sometimes in the form of a class. Hey, let's go through this book together. Let's go out for a coffee each week and we'll go through this book together. But sometimes it is just sharing what you've learned in the Lord. Casually. Conversationally. As you spend some time with them. What have you learned? What's helped your life? How have you, how's your walk been going with the Lord? Because you've got to realize that it's not just about you. Does it edify others? It's not just about what can I get away with. If you are actively living for Christ and seeking to disciple others. So to sum this up, the main motive is love, really. It comes down to love. When I'm thinking about the Christian decision-making process, it comes down to love. I love the Lord, my God, first. And I don't 
want to be brought under the power of anything else because nothing else must take his place in my life. I love the Lord. I want to please him. I want to make him smile when he looks at my life and sees how I interact at work, how I'm faithful to my wife when I'm away from home. I want to put a smile on his face when I'm at school and there's other students around me and they see that I have a different kind of life, a different kind of testimony. And they might laugh at me sometimes, but I know that God smiles at me. And I love my brothers and sisters. I love others. And so this must be a consideration with my decisions. I am free, but is my freedom helping my brothers and my sisters? Is it going to be a help to them or is it going to cause a problem for them? Our primary goal is first to serve Christ with our lives. The next time you make a decision on right or wrong, ask if this helps you to serve Him and know Him more. Remember the primary tool that we have in our life is God's Word. It's our book for determining principles. What is right, what is wrong. Barring all that, the primary motive is loving God and loving others. Is what I'm considering bringing me under its control? And is it beneficial for my brothers, for my sisters? Is it going to help? These are things that we all need to remember as we go into the coming week and decisions come our way. I'd like to invite you to stand, please. Just bow your head, close your eyes. Like I had mentioned earlier, I am, for the most part, speaking to brothers and sisters. And I know that. I mean, you're in the church. This is IBC Central. And so a retreat is a time to get away and just re-examine our walk with the Lord and see how we're doing and what we can do better. So that's, that's my heart. That's what I hope that you're able to take away from this as we look at Christian ethics, and that you, you can see where your worldview is, where your philosophy of life is. Is it based on the world or on God's word? And make the appropriate steps that God is directing you to make. Decisions that come into your life, these are important things. And I hope that what you're seeing here is a biblical. Go and search it and review it and see, is this right? But I also know that in any group this kind of size, the chances are there may be some that just don't truly know Christ. That's just mathematical probabilities. There may be some in here that don't know Christ. Maybe you've been a regular with IBC. You've been a regular attender. You've liked it. There's been something that's intrigued you. But um, you've never come to genuine true faith in Christ. You've never come to the cross. You've never bowed the knee and asked Christ to forgive you. You need to do that. Maybe you're trusting in something else. I've known many young people that perhaps went to a youth camp and their friends were going forward during an invitation time and so they didn't want to be left out so they went with their friends they were told by a counselor at the front well just repeat this prayer after me and they did and they left saying you know you're a Christian now great but there was never any real heart change in them and later in their life God convicted them got a hold of them and and they realized they needed Christ. They were not truly born again. There may be some who just think they're okay because their parents are Christians and they've been coming to church. There's the old saying that says God doesn't have any grandchildren. We all must come to him as children, born again sons and daughters of, of, of God, the Father. 
You need to be born.